the word people is being uh, challenged. The people of today are not following this concept. We recognized you when you came into our territory as a people with different ways, different concepts, different governments. And we said, well, we can work with you. We can live together in peace and harmony. But 400 years later, uh, you've lost your paper and you don't treat the native people as a people, don't recognize them as uh, someone with uh, human rights. This has to change. And that's why I'm out here is speaking about this because the Creator gave us a mind to think. And with this mind, He said, You can sit down, and if you have a dispute, you can sit down and resolve your dispute without going to war or having fights in, in that kind of manner. And so the, I had mentioned before that the members of the, uh, member nations of the Haudenosaunee have not fought against each other all of these years. <clears throat> and I said, you know, we have to look at natural laws, natural world. And if we look at the animals in the woods, we see deer, bear, uh, rabbits, pheasants, uh, partridge, mink, muskrats, beavers, all coexisting together on Mother Earth, each one with their own separate ways and their own territory. And these are the animals of the forest. We the, the brilliant species of the animal world in all of, our, all of these world, uh, years have not been able to learn how to live together in peace and harmony and recognize our differences. We're always trying to change people, change boundary lines. This is not the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to recognize our differences and respect those differences, but live together in peace and harmony. And that's what this belt is about. This is not happening. When George Washington sent Sullivan into a Onondaga to destroy our villages, the Haudenosaunee named him Onondagaius, which means town destroyer. And every president of the United States since that time carries that name. We wrote a letter to George Bush uh, last a couple years ago about some concerns and violations of our treaties. And we put the date on, and then we wrote Hunter de Gaius. Underneath, underneath that, we wrote President of the United States of White House, Washington, D.C., and his zip code number and so forth. Then we said, greetings, brother. But if you look at the history of your presidents of the United States and look at the name Town Destroyer, I think you will find that the name fits. It's all of these presidents. Uh, and Bob can probably tell you more about or list the, the presidents that have destroyed towns and countries. And, they dropped a bomb on Japan and wiped out thousands of people in a whole town. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and most recently there were George Bush is into Iraq. Uh, I don't know whether you people pay attention to the news or not. <coughs> I do. And uh, sometimes these reporters are are so much into the news that they, they don't they don't hear the news. What's that expression? You couldn't see the forest because of the trees. On July twenty first, Channel Five makes this report. <coughs> the Japanese have uh, manufactured a new toy. They call it puppy soccer. 
and you can sit with this machine and run dogs around and they play soccer. And the reporter says, United States government is examining this toy to see whether the mechanism of this uh, toy can be used in a future war. And I said, wow, that's interesting. And so that ends our uh, report for today. Thank you. We'll be back at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I went, wait a minute. You put out a news item, but you didn't finish. What agency is studying that toy? Department of War? Department of State, Justice Department, Department, Department of Interior. Tell me which one is doing that. They, they never reported. And further, <clears throat> what country is the United States thinking about going to war with? I guess we got that answered yesterday when uh, they announced that they're going to uh, attack Iran. And I'm going, wow. You're going to take Iran. You haven't finished with Iraq. You haven't finished up one without. You, you, you got to finish up one before you do the next one. But anyway, I'm still waiting for Channel 5 to come out with the answer to that. <laughs> I talked to uh, Dick Case when he came out to visit with me, and uh, I've known Dick for uh, a number of years also. <coughs> And I told him about that, and I thought maybe he would uh, put it in his paper, but uh, that didn't happen. I talked to Mike McAndrew, that wrote the article in this morning's paper about that, but uh, editors of the Post Standard are interested in that. It's uh, something that hasn't happened yet, and so. But I think we have to be aware of, of what these people are reporting, because What the report is something that's going to come in the future. Now, Bob, I, I, we, I mentioned that uh, the Europeans came up the Hudson River and settled in our, in our house. And uh, at the time, we didn't have immigration rules and regulations or laws, you know, so. <laughs> and we didn't have a fence or a wall that these people had to cross or crawl over or under. <laughs> so they just kept coming into our territory. And, and if you look at history and what is happening in Indian territory and say, well, we have to watch out for that because that could happen. And I'm watching the news now and I got down on the Mexican border, you got people are coming in and guess what? These Europeans that came into our territory as immigrants are now complaining about the immigrants that are coming in, I'm going, well, <laughs> there's an expression out there, that, was it, uh, pot is calling kettle black? <laughs> and there's opposition to this whole thing, you know, but um, eventually it's going to have to be worked out. Otherwise you're going to have further chaos in, in, in the world, in your world. And you need to have respect for people. I was listening to uh, Pope. He's in Vatican City, and he's in that tower with a little window on it that where he waves at everybody. <laughs> he's standing in there one day, and he's telling, he says, down on the first floor of this building, there's a big meeting going on. He says, the various leaders of the various denominations of religion are sitting down, and they got a very important meeting. They're learning how to work together. And these are their topics. And he listed about six different topics that they were talking about. I was sitting in a chair listening to him and I said, wait a minute, you're not, you're, you're missing the most important aspect of this. And I, I think I got some little assistance here. I said, if those leaders are sitting there talking about their different ways, the only way that they're going to be able to come to any kind of agreement is they have to sit down and respect each other's church and the people in the church. If they don't have respect 
for each other, they're not going to be able to work together. And as I said these words through my television set, <laughs> the Pope looked down at the floor, looked back up, waved again at the people from his little window and says, oh, he says, uh, by the way, he says, I forgot one important thing. I forgot to mention that they're down there talking about respect for each other. I'd like to uh, thank our panelists and speakers for a very uh, interesting and inspiring uh, presentation connecting the past with the present and the future. And uh, why don't we give a big round of applause. All right, we have about uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, for questions. There are two microphones, there's one in the aisle and one over here. Those people who are up in the gallery, probably you'll have to come down and use these uh, microphones so you can be heard, so it's audible. But I certain wel certainly welcome all of you uh, to engage your panel with uh, any of your questions. Hey Dick, no questions. <laughs> It means one of two things. One, I'd, we done a very good job of explaining about the history so, so well that you don't have any questions. Or two, you ain't got the foggiest idea of what we were talking about. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, I certainly think you did an excellent job. Uh, whether I have the foggiest idea, I don't know. That's another matter altogether. Uh, I'm curious about two sort of related questions. W one is, have there been any or are there any anticipated uh, frontal challenges either through the courts or through legislature to the doctrine of discovery? And uh, also related to that is, has the Haudenosaunee uh, tried to establish or is thinking about establishing any sort of formal dialogue with the Vatican to address the uh, issue of the 15th century uh, papal bulls that the doctrine of discovery is uh, sort of based on? Well, <laughs> well, son of a what a question. <coughs> One of the things that a problem with uh, the things that you, you mentioned is that uh, we have been unable to get into the courts to uh, express our concerns or express our grievances against the state of uh, New York or the United States. Back in 1972, there was a meeting in New York City. 85 different uh, nations were there. And uh, 85 different nations were there. And they were there because they had problems with the United States and they were unable to speak from any kind of platform to anybody to, about these uh, concerns that they had. So they said to us, us, the Orrin Lyons and myself were at this meeting, and they said, you have international treaties with the French, the Dutch, and the English, so you have uh, international uh, uh, office. We want you to open up your international office and provide us with the means so that we can talk to the world. So Orrin and I came back to uh, Onondaga, represented to the Onondaga nation the request from these various uh, nations from out west. And the Onondaga Council says, yeah, we can do that. We'll call a meeting, we'll get all the nations together. Grant's House was called under the process and procedures uh, that was set down in 1142. We had our meeting and uh, It was decided that we would open up our doors and we would go to Geneva, Switzerland at the UN. And there we would provide a platform from which the native people could present to the world the grievances that they have against the United States. Now in order to get over to Geneva, Switzerland, <coughs> you had to cross the waters, you had to go through uh, gates, you had to cross lines. 
And there's a process and procedures to do that. And we didn't know anything about how to do that, though we had heard, you know, that there was this process. So we said, well, how do you do that? He said, well, you, gotta get, have a, you need a passport. A passport, yes. You get a passport, you go down to uh, New York City, you talk to the embassy down there, you get a visa, and the visa allows you to go into a country for a certain period of time, for a certain purpose. So I said, well, he says, well, <clears throat> where do we get a passport? Go down to the federal building. So we went down to the federal building. They had a passport for U.S. citizens. <clears throat> we don't consider ourselves citizens of the United States or the state of New York. And for us to travel to Geneva, Switzerland on U.S. passport would be uh, something that we could not we could not do so we designed our own passport and uh, got it printed up in 1977 we sent a delegation of uh, 40 some people over to Geneva Switzerland to present on behalf of the indigenous people since that time we have been into 139 different countries with our passport And this is an act of sovereignty. We as a people uh, qualify to be a member of the United States, the United Nations. There are five uh, things that you have to have before you become a member of the United Nations. One, you have to have a land base. Two, you have to have a form of government. Three, you have to have a way of settling disputes. And four, you need a, a language. So we have all of these things. And we had them before the, the people came into our, our territory. I, it was, Dick mentioned that I have been sitting as a leader of the Onondagas in the Beaver Clan position for 35 years. Putting me into that position was done under the process and procedures that were set down in 1142 uh, when the Haudenosaunee was formed. The songs, the speeches that were done at that time to put our leaders up, they're still done today. <laughs> so uh, we could become members of the United Nations, but we won't because it, it kind of clouds your status or who you are if you say you're, you're this and then you, you do other things. So we have not done so, but uh, the United States is a, is, is a member of the United Nations. The United States has a land base, yes? They have leaders, yes? They have uh, a president. <laughs> who was asked a couple of weeks ago to define sovereignty, and he couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> sovereignty is easy to define. Sovereignty, according to Webster's Dictionary, means that you are the absolute power. There are no other powers in there. The Onondagas have lived in this territory for the last 10,000 years, alongside of the Oneidas, and next to the Cayugas. <clears throat> Our territory runs from Lake Ontario down into the middle of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> we are the government of this people, of, of this territory, and been there since, for the last 10,000 years, since the glacier left. <clears throat> There's no dispute over who, who governs that territory. Uh, Oneidas don't uh, challenge us, the Cayugas don't, and the other nations don't. So this is Onondaga Nation territory, governed by the Onondaga Nation. There are international laws out there that come into effect also. Governments cannot tax governments. Just on general principle, I guess. I don't, I don't know the laws. I have to talk to uh, Joe Heath. 
on these issues, on some of these legal issues, but uh, <coughs> Bob, do you have well, anything you want to add to the? Uh, well, we, we want to finish up on this one. This is important because governments cannot tax governments. The United States government cannot tax the Onondaga Nation unless we sit down and agree on how that will happen and how the taxes will be. New York State cannot tax the Onondaga Nation unless we sit down and agree how that's going to be. Constitution of the United States says so. It gives the pro, uh, process and procedures for that to happen. <coughs> we have been told that our treaties are 200 years old. Well, the Constitution of the United States is 200 years old so also. But you can't cast that aside because it's 200 years old. That is still in effect. You people sitting in the audience have rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. And for people in the state of New York who complain about the treaties that we have, saying they're too old, do away with them. I hope they don't come around and tell you people that the United States Constitution is too old, we should do away with it. Because if they do, you people are going to be in a lot of trouble. With regard to uh, negotiations with the Vatican, there is an informal dialogue uh, with lower echelon Vatican people, so the answer to the Vatican thing is yes. Uh, because the Pope approved the right of discovery, it becomes a Christian doctrine, so any of you who call yourselves Christians, get your churches to uh, do something about that. Uh, the other issue is uh, frontal assault. In 1823, the United States Supreme Court declared that it supported the right of discovery. Now, George W. Bush has an interesting issue. Does he believe in precedent? Does he believe you can overthrow Roe versus Wade? If he does, we can go after McIntosh, 1823. It's going to be very interesting for the American people, liberals and uh, conservatives alike, to see what they're going to do. If we keep precedent, oops, well, the answer is we overruled Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896 which declared segregation legal in Brown versus Board of Education. So we do selective uh, nullification of Supreme Court acts. And I hope we will keep Roe versus Wade and I hope we will nullify uh, 1823 decision by the Supreme Court, short name Macintosh. But the frontal assault is gonna be very difficult because I've testified both in Canada and the United States and in both courts the premise of the government lawyers for Canada, the premise of the government lawyers for the United States is the right of discovery. And on the first day of the trial, they will bring this up and they will read it into the court record just as it was uh, a litany. So it is going to be uh, the, the public. This Columbus Day, do something about it. Columbus Day is not simply a day to talk about the arrival of a foreign people. It talks about the doctrine that lies at the basis of why Syracuse is white land, why Cornell is white land. Do something about it on Columbus Day. Remind people that this is what it stands for, for Native people. Native people are not just upset that Columbus got here. It's how he got here with this doctrine which the Protestant nations adapted uh, as their own. Yep. Wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the, um, the changes in the balance of power during this, this time we're talking about from 1600 to the um, late 1700s because as I've read the history that seems critical in understanding the treaties and where we've come to, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in the American Revolution, there were 22,000 people in New York City. 22,000. We're talking about tiny demographics. 
I didn't bring up 1524 and the epidemic in Western Seneca country for nothing. The average drop of an Indian population just to disease and warfare was 90%. That's the average drop. Some nations dropped even more. So while whites were smaller populations than Indian populations, the gains made by the whites in terms of their immigration was also enhanced by the fact that Indians were continuing to die of, of disease. So the demographics are, are frightening. And anyone who doesn't believe that epidemics can have a major impact on world history, uh, such as the AIDS epidemic or whatever uh, epidemic of the era is, needs to look at what happened from 1492 uh, onward, the, the destruction of Indian America uh, was was astounding. The problems with regard to the struggles of power is that uh, Native people were attracted by some of the material goods that the Europeans brought, and then various Europeans allied with different peoples. So the Algonquins, who are the traditional enemies of the Haudenosaunee long before 1492 end up allying with the French. Well, what are the Haudenosaunee going to do? You have a, the equivalent of a missile race. The Haudenosaunee have to get guns from the Dutch so that they can defend themselves from the Algonquins and the French. And everybody has to get more and more guns because if they don't get guns, they're going to die. So both sides are involved in this. And what do they do? They go into what we call the Beaver Wars the wars that uh, control over the areas of North America that have a lot of uh, furs. And the, the question there is the, the beaver wars destroy uh, not only through warfare but also through philosophy uh, Native people's foundations because Native peoples believe in an equality of souls well, how can you go out and market economy beaver pelts and otter pelts and still respect people with souls? One of the reasons so many Indians converted to Christianity was because Christianity bailed them out on the beaver war issue. Christians don't believe the beavers have souls. So you become a Christian, you don't have to worry about your tradition. You can go out and kill the beavers for as much as you want. But the beaver wars changed the societies. And the question is, uh, is gambling today the new buffalo, as so many people are romantically saying it? Or is it the new beaver wars? And is it going to destroy American Indian cultures just as surely as the beaver wars divided them in the 1600s? Right. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, can you, you've talked about the treaties and uh, with the United States and the Haudenosaunee. Can you talk a little bit about how complicated it becomes with us Canadian Haudenosaunees? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there are, you know, there's man-made barriers, man-made borders there, but the treaties still apply to the Haudenosaunee. Well, the treaties uh, that were made uh, with uh, England and the United States is recognized by the United States. Mm -hmm. But Canada doesn't recognize the treaties because they weren't part of that. So the problem then, then is these can Canadian governments are saying, well, we weren't a part of it, we didn't agree to that, so the treaties don't apply. But the treaties that were made by the Haudenosaunee, uh, the first one we made was in 1701. The Haudenosaunee allowed uh, occupation or the use of a strip of land 800 miles long, 400 miles wide to be used by those people that were living up in what is now Canada. The last line of that treaty says the Haudenosaunee will have hunting and fishing rights and gathering rights in that territory, which means that the Haudenosaunee did not turn that land over completely. It was land to be used jointly under this concept of living together and sharing. We have the right, and that treaty is still in effect as far as I know, so we have the right 
as Holding the Shoney people to hunt in Canada in that 800 by 400 miles square because we have uh, joint use of it. The problem is Canada. Canada doesn't recognize that treaty. It doesn't recognize the Jay Treaty. Jay Treaty of 1794 between the United States and England, not recognized by, uh, by Canada. So native people living in Canada that come from the Haudenosaunee are having problems now because uh, they say they're, uh, they're not residents, they're not uh, citizens of Canada, and they're forcing them to go through uh, uh, an expensive process to become residents or citizens of Canada. It costs about $1,400 to do this. But this is where this exchange of power comes in. We had such a, an agreement uh, meeting in uh, Colgate University, uh, Colgate College some years ago. I was a speaker there. I ended up on the front page of New York Times at that time because of my presentation. And in the audience, uh, when I made this presentation, was a lawyer for the, uh, the whites who were arguing with the Oneidas. And when I finished, he went, right on her. What happened was that we, we broke for lunch. And we went to lunch, and on the way back, I uh, went by this house. I looked in the window, and there was this nice couch, a few chairs, a television set, but there was no one in the room. And I said, wow, very nice and empty room. So I got back to the uh, place where the workshop was being held. And I, I explained, you know, that uh, the Haudenosaunee has people at the Longhouse, and people were moving into the Mohawk empty houses, rooms. And uh, they were, what they were doing was they were sending loads over to uh, the government, New York State, and saying, we found this spot. Is it okay for us to move in there? New York would say, yes, it's okay for you to do that. Now, Earl was the one who was writing the letter, so this place then became Earlville. <laughs> uh, and as you go around New York State, you find Earlville, you find uh, names of various people, is, uh, and founded in 1884 or something like that. But that's what these people were doing. They had come into our house, went into an empty room, settled, and then asked permission from uh, the state of New York that they could live there. And the state of New York said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I said to the people that there were in this room, I said, uh, I just come by this nice house, had a nice room there, and I said, I'm going to write to the Onondaga Nation and ask if I can move in. 